before the message this morning, I asked Monica to do a song that she did a month or two ago. It goes along so well with the message, and I know in my life I get a lot more out of a song the second or third time I hear it. I just wanted you to hear this song again. So sit back, enjoy this song, let it minister to your heart this morning. Somebody finding love, somebody finding love unfailing. I want to be a part, I want to be a part. Somebody finding life, somebody finding life everlasting. I want to play a part, I want to play a part. Somebody finding hope. Somebody finding hope in God of heaven. It's my desire, Lord, you would use me to change somebody else's destiny. I want to be a part, I want to be a part of somebody else's story. Somebody else's When they're hurting I want to play a part I want to play a part Caring for the widow Sheltering the orphan It's my desire Lord, you would use me To change somebody else's destiny Monica. Thanks, guys. All of you guys sounded great. Take your Bibles and go to Luke 8. I love that song. And uh, this morning, you'll notice on the handout, 
that the uh, message is entitled, Becoming Part of Somebody Else's Story. And uh, we're going to be in Luke 8 this morning, Luke chapter number 8. And if you do not have a Bible, grab the one in front of you there and use that. That's what it's there for. We want you to look into the Bible and not just hear it. We want you to see it. And, uh, you know, I, I <laughs> was thinking about this story, this, this guy that we're going to talk about this morning. And I was thinking about before and after pictures. And I thought, you know, weight loss programs use that a lot in an effort to get you to buy their product. They'll say, okay, here's what this lady looked like before she used our weight loss program. Here's what she looks like now. And they'll do a before and after picture. Uh, workout programs, muscle building programs, wrinkle removing creams, you name it. And they love to do the before and after pictures. And this morning, I want us to look at a true story of a man that had quite a dramatic before and after picture. Uh, last week, we actually looked at this story in Mark 5. This morning, it's also told in Luke 8. So I wanted to go to Luke 8 and look at it again before moving on. This is Luke's account, and we see quite a before and after. I want you to look at verse number 26, please. Verse 26. It says, And they arrived. Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city... A certain man, which had devils long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. In Mark 5, it says that he's running through the graveyard, screaming and yelling, cutting himself with rocks and stones. And so this guy is, is, is out here living in the cemetery, uh, probably had had a bath in who knows when, got you know dried blood and fresh blood all over his body. And, and he comes to the Lord Jesus and meets Jesus here. Well, that's the before. But after he met Christ, look at verse 35 and notice what we see here. It says, then they went out to see what was done. And they came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. What a before and after. You know, I mean, what is it that led to such an incredible change in this guy's life? Well, I'm going to tell you where the change started. Look at verse 28. It says there, verse 28, when he saw Jesus. That's when things began to change. This guy had quite a story to tell and he told it. Look at verse 39. It says in verse 39, Jesus said to him, return to thine own house, show how great things God hath done unto thee. Well, it says he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. Jesus said, just go home to your friends and tell them. This guy ends up going through the whole city. And Mark says he went all throughout Decapolis and he was telling them the great story of what Christ had done. He told his story. I'm sure many that did not know him previously probably couldn't believe that this guy was once in that state. I could just see him telling his story and saying, man, I used to live in the tombs. I'd run around naked. I was cutting myself, and I was playing a fool. And they're probably looking at this really sharp, nice guy thinking, I can't believe you were ever like that. And he's like, no, that, that was me before I knew Jesus Christ. And in your handout, it says that if you are saved, you have a story also. In other words, somebody impacted you with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody reached out to you. Somebody cared about you. Somebody made a difference in your life. Who was that somebody? Think about it. Who made an impact on your life and caused you to want to accept Christ as your Savior? Maybe it was several people, but guess what? All of them are part of your story of salvation. They're part of your story of coming to know the Lord. They're part of your, as she sung, they're part of your story of redemption. And, and if you were to tell me your conversion story of how you got saved, how you came to know the Lord, you would probably tell me about that person or those people that impacted you, that made a difference in your life. What an honor for them, listen, what an honor for them to be part of your story of salvation. But my question this morning is this, 
And I think you're going to find the message to be very helpful, very encouraging, because the question is this, are you part of somebody else's story? In other words, are there people on this earth, or maybe they're in heaven now, and they're telling their story of how they got saved, and you're in their story. You're like, yeah. They say, yeah, you know, so-and-so, and, -so, and they, your name's in the blank. They really uh, were patient with me and shared Christ with me and loved me to Jesus. Are you part of someone else's story? Have you helped to bring someone to Jesus? Did you know, church, that God will gladly use you to be part of somebody else's story? God wants to use you. And this morning, I want to look at the greatest evangelist who ever lived, Jesus Christ. And I want us to learn from him how that we can become part of someone else's story. How that our life can have true, divine impact on others for Christ. The first principle I want to give you is this. Number one is very simple. Look for divine opportunities. Jesus Christ arrives by boat to this land area called uh, the Gadarenes. Look at verse 26. It says, and they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And then it says, verse 27, he gets out of the boat here, and it says, when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man. Here, now, <laughs> this is a divine opportunity, but it did not look like it on the surface. The, here's Jesus, pulls up. He's got his disciples, they come by boat, they come to this land area that's in northern Israel, it's by Galilee and the Sea of Galilee, and so he comes into this area, they, they dock their boat, they go to get out, and the Bible says they were met by a certain man. You say, well, man, that sounds like a great opportunity. Well, on the surface, it might not have seemed like it. Let's look at the rest of the verse. Look at verse 27. It says, which had devils long time and wear no clothes... Neither abode in any house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice, he said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. In other words, he hollers at the top. Here's this crazy, bloody man, and, and he yells out and basically says, Get out of my life. Get out of here. Don't you torment me. Get out of here, Jesus. If a, if a naked, bloody man came up to you and said that, you may not look at that as an opportunity, amen? <laughs> the disciples were probably like, he is a bloody, nutty nut. Let's get out of here. You know, let's get out of here. Come on, get back in the boat, Jesus, let's go. You know, but Jesus saw this man, and he saw divine opportunity. It kind of reminds me of, uh, of a guy that I met, and I invited him to church. And man, I, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but he cussed me up one side and down the other. And he's like, you can take your blankety-blank religion, and you can blankety-blank with it, because I'm never coming to your blankety-blank church. And I want you to know, he didn't say blankety-blank either. <laughs> We're going to keep this G-rated, amen? But I mean, he was cursing and swearing and just telling me what I could do with my faith. And to make a long story short, I ended up several weeks later leading that man to Jesus Christ. And he got involved in our church, and man, he got really active, and uh, it was funny because he'd been coming, around. I just kept trying to befriend him. I thought, no, I'm not going to let this guy scare me off. So I just kept befriending him, I kept inviting him, and uh, finally, he, he was a painter. He'd come over and he'd help us do some projects, but he wouldn't come to church. Finally, one day, I see him come into church, you know, and, uh, and, and he's kind of a real rough guy, you know, and he came in, and uh, then finally, one day, he just burst into my office and didn't, didn't even check with anybody. He just opens up the door, slings it open. He just collapsed in the chair in front of me and go, well, are you ready to save me? <laughs> that was his way of saying, I want to be saved, you know. He just plopped down and goes, are you ready to save me? And I said, well, I can't save you, but I said, Jesus can. And uh, he said, well, come on, let's get with it. I want to get saved, you know. And so... 
a real rough guy, but he ended up getting saved, and, and he really was faithful and, and served the Lord until he ended up dying of cancer. But, you know, sometimes things don't look like opportunities on the surface like this, but they really are. And I think that, I think that we miss opportunities to make an impact with our life simply because we're not aware. We're not sensitive to those opportunities. And so we just let them pass right by. We just let them go right by us. And, and Jesus didn't do that. He stopped what he was doing, right? And he reaches out to this man. This man then in turn told his story all over town. He ended up telling everybody how great things Jesus had done unto him. And I've said this before, and I'm gonna say it again. Some of our greatest spiritual opportunities come disguised as interruptions. Some of our greatest spiritual opportunities come disguised as interruptions. Society tried to put this guy away. They tried to chain him up. When that didn't work, they just hoped that he'd disappear into the mountains, that he'd die in the cemetery somewhere cutting himself. This guy had hit rock bottom when Jesus Christ came along. And Jesus was there, and Jesus saw the opportunity to impact this man and to see his life radically changed. And, and you know, the, the, the thing is this. There are people maybe at your job, and they've hit rock bottom in their life. They just need somebody to care. There's somebody maybe in your neighborhood. They've hit rock bottom. They just need somebody to reach out and care. It may be someone right here on property with you right now, and they've got one of these bags. If they're carrying one of those, what does that mean? Right. It means that they've never been here before. It's their first time, right? And that, that means that's an opportunity because, you know, most people don't go to a church to hear a good sermon. Most people go to church because they need friends. They need somebody to care. And so, you know, you may have opportunity right here, right this morning to impact somebody's life and to become part of their story. But my point is, is that many times we let that stuff fly right by us and we don't take advantage of those divine opportunities. Christ lives in you and he can use you, but you got to look for those divine opportunities. Let me give you the second thing. Number two, the second thing I learned from Jesus is that I have to engage others in spiritual conversations. You know, it's interesting. Jesus asked this guy a question. Look at verse 30. All right, everybody skip down there to verse 30. It says here, now look at it. Very simple principle, but very, very profound. Look at this, verse 30. And Jesus, what's the next two words? Asked him, right? So he's going he's gonna to embark on a conversation here. And then what, what did he ask him? He said what? What is thy name? That's pretty basic, right? You want to find out about somebody, that's a pretty good place to start. Would you all agree? You know, pretty good place to start. Hey, my name's Dan. What's your name? Walter. Walter. That was pretty easy, wasn't it, Walter? Yeah. Yeah. You just go up to somebody and say, hey, I'm Dan. What's your name? And, you know, as you begin a conversation with people, you begin to... Now, Jesus, I mean, Jesus found out this guy had major issues. He started out, what's your name? And from that, he ends up discovering this guy had some, ma this guy's rock bottom. He had some major demonic oppression and possession in his life. Satan had just messed this guy's life up. Look at verse number 31, I'll show you. It says here, uh, verse 30, what is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. Guy, the guy went by the name Legion. Can you imagine that? What's your name? Legion. Really? Why is your name Legion? Oh, because I got so many devils in me. That's what he said. Verse 31, and they besought him. Now that the devils in him start to speak, they besought Jesus that he would not command them to go out into the deep. By the way, I think the significance of that, they didn't want to go out into the deep. They were afraid Jesus would cast them into the deep. I think he's referring there to the deep abyss where the Bible says that there are many demons that are already chained in the deep and they're reserved unto judgment. 
They're, they're, they're there, and they are suffering until the day of judgment. They didn't want to go there. They had been put in this land area of Israel because Satan was fortifying his troops because he knew the Messiah was there. And so Satan had all of his emissaries there, and he's fortifying his troops. These demons had been given the responsibility of this area of Gennesaret. And so they're like, we don't want to leave our post. We don't want to leave here. And so they asked Jesus, can we go into those pigs, into those swine? Look at verse number 32. It says, and there was an herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer, allow them to enter into them. And he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. Now, the demons, of course, didn't die because they're spirits, but the, the, the pigs did. And you say, well, why would they want to do that? Again, they wanted to be able to function in their capacity for Satan in that land area. So they knew they had to occupy somewhere. So that makes sense. Unclean spirit, unclean animal, right? Unclean animal, a pig. And so these unclean spirits want to go in an unclean animal. They're on a mountain. Satan loves the high places, right? And so he wants to be able to go up in these high places, and they want to enter into these pigs. It's too much for the pigs. They end up running off a cliff, and they end up drowning. I mean, it's all pretty dramatic stuff here, but it all really happened. And we see the significance of, the, of all of this. But my point is this. All this happens because Jesus Christ simply started a conversation, and he started it out with, what is your name? And, and this is how Jesus found out what was going on with this man, and Jesus Christ was able to help him because he found out what was going on with this man. And we can do the same thing. Obviously, I don't believe it's going to probably be like this. It's not going to be that dramatic and demon possession, all that, but do people get in bondage to Satan today, yes or no? Absolutely. They hit rock bottom. Satan's got them duped, man. They're deceived, and they need help. They need somebody to reach out, somebody to just take an interest and start a conversation up. And, and here's the deal. When you do that, you put Jesus on their radar screen of their mind because, like I said, many people, he's not on their radar. There are people who will wake up this morning on Sunday, and they'll go to bed tonight, and they will give absolutely not an ounce of a thought to Jesus, to the Bible, to God, uh, to heaven, to hell, none of that. Worship, none of that will even cross their mind. Why? He's just not on their radar. They give no thought to it at all. This man and the demons that controlled him, they never gave any thought to Jesus until confronted by Jesus. I remember I went, uh, got a friend of mine that's an air traffic controller in Atlanta, and he let me go in. I got, you had to go through security and all that procedures. But I got to go in where they were doing the air traffic control in Atlanta. And it was weird. It was like a spaceship, you know. And you're in here and it's dark. And they got all these guys sitting in front of these monitors. And he's showing me how these planes will enter into the radar screen. And he says, now from here, we will pick them up. And we will take them from here. And we'll bring them and we'll land them. And he's showing me all this stuff. It's like, wow. And I thought, you know, that's like a lot of people. Jesus is not on their radar screen at all. He's just not there. And by you opening up a conversation and by you talking to that person, you are now putting him on their radar. See, at least you're doing that. Because I know sometimes you get discouraged and you think, man, I've invited people to church. I've invited them to walk through Bethlehem. I've invited people, you know, I've tried to talk to people about Jesus and about the Bible, but they just don't seem very interested. And, and what I want to encourage you is, is that, by talking to them, you have at least put Jesus on their radar screen to where at least now they're forced to think about him and spiritual things, whereas before they never even gave it a thought. That's where it all begins. I was talking to one of our members, Colette McGuire. Uh, she goes to the early service, uh, the first service, and she was telling me after last week, you know, both of her parents were atheists. They raised her up to be a staunch atheist. And she said, whenever people would talk to me about the Lord, she said, I would brush them off. I'd be very arrogant. I would act like I didn't want to hear it. Oh, that's just a joke. I don't even want to hear that stuff. And she said, that's the way I would act outwardly. But she said, I would walk off. And she said, I would think about what they said to me. I would think on it. I would dwell on it. And it would bother me. She ended up coming to faith in Jesus Christ. But I'm sure many people who talked to her probably thought they were getting nowhere.
but they were putting Jesus on the radar screen of her mind. I know for me, Jesus wasn't on my radar at all. My brother, who's nine years older than me, he got saved. And and when he was 20, he began witnessing to me, and I was like 11. And it took several years of him having conversations with me before I was ready to trust Christ. He engaged me in some spiritual conversations. What I want you to know is this, though. And I'm going to show a little video of my brother. I asked him to, to just do a little video clip of this. But here's what I want you to know. Listen to me. When my brother started witnessing to me and he led me to Christ, he was not a pastor. He was not a preacher. He was just working a job, serving at a church, knew very, very little Bible but he ended up becoming part of my story. And I I want you to watch this. Watch this real quickly. It's not very long at all. Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Proctor, and uh, I've been asked to say a few words about the privilege that I had of leading your pastor, Pastor Dan, to faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, Dan, my brother, is nine years younger than I am. And oftentimes, when my mom and dad would go out of town, I had the responsibility of watching Dan there at home, and I know that in and of itself is maybe a scary thought, but uh, I would uh, babysit Dan, uh, for lack of a better term, and take care of Dan while mom and dad were out of town. Well, just a few years earlier, I, I had been saved. I was saved when I was 15 years old. I was hitchhiking in St. Louis, Missouri, and I know that may sound strange, but back in those days, in the early 70s, hitchhiking was not considered to be dangerous, and and we all did it. and. One day I wanted to go to the shopping mall. I didn't have a ride, so I just went out and hitchhiked. A total stranger picked me up and started witnessing to me. He started telling me about Jesus and how salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and I had never heard that before. And by the time we got to the shopping mall, I was ready to pray. I was ready to receive Christ. And sitting there in the passenger seat, he led me in prayer, and he helped me to receive Christ as my Savior on that day. I didn't know everything that had happened to me that day, but I knew that something was different. I went for another five years and did not grow in the Lord because I didn't get into a good church. Our parents took us to a church that was more of a social club than a church. The gospel was never really preached. I didn't get grounded for five years. But then at the age of 20, I visited a Baptist church and God got a hold of my heart and I just surrendered my life to him and I said, Lord, I just want to serve you uh, with the rest of my life. And I was taught in that church to to be a soul winner, that you ought to witness to other people. So I didn't know anything about the Bible. I thought the book of Job was the book of Job. I thought maybe it was about unemployment. I didn't know the Old Testament from the New Testament and uh, knew absolutely nothing about the Bible. But somebody showed me how to take the book of Romans and lead somebody to faith in Jesus Christ. And so I memorized those verses. And I immediately started witnessing, first of all, to my own family. I started witnessing to my mom and my dad and my two brothers and started planting those seeds of faith in their hearts. And uh, I started dating a girl that was in a gospel group, a good Christian girl who later became my wife. And she was part of a gospel group. And I started bringing home gospel records. I had thrown away all of my rock and roll records and I was listening to gospel music. And I got Dan hooked on gospel music. He started listening to these records. And even the lyrics of the songs were planting seeds in his heart. And so uh, every opportunity that I would get, I would witness to Dan. And uh, this went on for a period of, uh, of quite some time, uh, several weeks, maybe even a couple of years. And uh, then it was one of those weekends when mom and dad was out of town and I was watching Dan. So I took Dan to, to my church uh, as opposed to the church that we grew up in. And I'll never forget, on the way home, Dan looked at me from the passenger seat and he said, Steve, every time I leave your church, I feel guilty. And I said, Dan, that's the Holy Spirit telling you in your heart that you need to be saved. I didn't say another word. We rode home the rest of the way in silence. And I'll never forget when we pulled into the driveway, he looked over at me from the passenger seat and said, Steve, I want to be saved. And then and there, he put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And he was saved sitting there in the car, just like I had been saved, sitting in a car a few years earlier. I've had a lot of soul winning experiences since then, but none more precious than that. And so I just want to encourage anyone that sees this video to 
to be a soul winner. You don't have to have a, de a degree in theology. I, I, I mean it when I say I knew virtually nothing about the Bible except the Romans Road, how to lead a soul to Christ. And uh, when does a candle burn the brightest? When it's first lit or after it's been lit for a few years? Well, it ought to burn just as brightly when it's first lit. So whether you've been saved one week, one month, one year, or 10 years, let me encourage you to be a faithful witness and to tell others about Jesus Christ. It can change their life and it can change their eternity. Thanks and God bless you. Isn't that good, church? Amen. I appreciate uh, my brother doing that. I really appreciate him doing that. I wanted, and I really wanted to do that. I had someone tell me after the 945 service, they're like, man, that was so encouraging today. Uh, and and uh, a guy in our church, he's a business owner, but he's like, man, the, anybody can do that. You know, it's just a matter of looking for those opportunities, engaging people in spiritual conversations like Jesus did. What is your name? You know, and then there's a third thing, and it may come as a surprise to you, and I want you to look at it. The third principle is this. Know when to walk away. <laughs> know when to walk away. Uh, did you know that we cannot save anybody? Can I get an amen, huh? Amen. Yeah, we can't save anybody. Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. You cannot force a person to become a believer. Some people need time. One conversation isn't going to cut it. It's not going to do it. I know for me, one conversation wasn't enough for me. You know, I mean, when my brother uh, got serious about the Lord, we thought he'd gone off the deep end. We thought he was crazy. We thought he was Looney Tunes. And it, it took a lot more than one conversation for me. Don't give up. You know, it, you know, it's some people are intimidated and they're fearful when you talk about spiritual things, but that's normal. We're all intimidated by things that we know little or nothing about. And in fact, that happened to Jesus right here in our text. Now, you would think, right, that this dramatic turnaround's happened in this guy's life, right? You'd think everyone in that area got saved, right? Let's see what happened. Look down at verse number 34. It says, when they that fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also which saw it told them by what means he that was possessed of the devils was healed. And then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about besought him, Jesus, to depart from them. For they were taken with great fear, and he went up into the ship and returned again. These people knew that all these pigs had been killed. That was their livelihood, I guess. They cared more about pigs than they did people, and they didn't want to hear any more about it. They did not want to talk about it. Uh, they're like, look, man, we don't know what you're about. We don't know what it is you're doing, but get out of here. We do not want you here. We don't need it, and we don't want it. So Jesus, if you will, kindly leave. Not everybody that met Jesus got saved and believed. Jesus encountered some rejection. So what did he do? The Bible says he went up into the ship and he returned back again. You know what he did? He walked away. He sailed away. He did not push it down their throat. They saw, they heard. The seed had been planted. Now the seed would have to be watered. It'd have to be fertilized, which that man they got saved. That's what he was going to do, see? But Jesus Christ was now on their radar. He hadn't been before that. But what they saw and what they heard could never be erased from their minds. If you invite somebody to church or you tell someone about the Lord, you uh, try to tell somebody about your salvation and about Christ, maybe it's just as simple as you try to get them to come to walk through Bethlehem. And they're just not very receptive at first. That's okay. Walk away. That's okay to walk away. You don't have to feel like you have failed. In your handout, it says walk away, but walk away knowing that you did your part. Walk away knowing you did your part. You may get an opportunity to water that seed later, or guess what? You may not. Another person may have to come and water that seed later. 
That's okay. In fact, someone else may end up getting to lead them to Christ. You planted the seed, somebody else gets to partake of the fruit. Paul said, man, that's okay. It's God that gives the end. It's all for God's glory anyway. Amen, church? It's all for Him. So that's okay. You're part of their story anyway. It's like that guy that was in the car with Steve, pitched, picked him up hitchhiking. You know, he, here he is witnessing to this 15-year-old kid and leads him to the Lord that day in St. Louis, Missouri. And I'm, I don't know if that guy's still alive. I'm sure Steve has no clue who he was or what his name was. But you know what? That guy went on his way having no idea of what that kid would end up doing for the Lord. He had no idea of the impact that he made on eternity that day by being a faithful witness. That guy had no idea that that kid would go on to be a pastor of a great church in Poplar Bluff, Missouri that's reaching hundreds and hundreds of people for Christ. He had no idea that's what was sitting in his car when that guy was a faithful witness to my brother. He opened up a spiritual conversation. My brother was open. My brother got saved that day. You just never know, do you? Number four, the last thing is this. You can become part of somebody else's story by telling, keep telling your own story. Just keep telling your own story. Jesus is able to lead this one man to salvation in this town. One man, one guy he's able to lead to salvation. But what a difference it made in this man's life. Then this guy became an ambassador, and he began sharing his story everywhere. Look at verse 39. It says, return to thine house and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. You know what I thought about church? And I thought this was such a cool thought. I thought, here the whole city, the whole town basically comes out and gives Jesus the boot. And they say, get out of here. We don't want it. We don't need it. Get out of here. And they give Jesus the boot. But you know what? This guy's left behind, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but this guy's left behind to tell his story, and I wonder, there is no telling how many people who initially had rejected Christ, there's no telling how many of them ended up coming to Christ because of this man's testimony. You know, this man didn't want to stay. He wanted to go with Jesus. Look at verse 38. It says, now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away. He said, no, no, no. You know, he, get the picture, okay? Here's the river bank right here, right? Here's the Sea of Galilee bank, and here's Jesus. He's getting into his boat. The disciples, they've been asked to leave, so they're, he, they, they've just been able to reach this one guy, but they get in their boat, and uh, the disciples are all in the boat. And all of a sudden, this man who was a maniac, he was just a complete, uh, just, just a crazed lunatic. Now he's completely clothed in his right mind. And he says, Jesus, can I go with you? I, I, I want to go with you. I want to I be with you. And Jesus looks at him and says, no, no, you can't go with me. Because you've got work to do right here. There is a mission field for you right here. There is a harvest for you to reach right here. And I'm leaving you behind, and I want you to go and tell everybody how great things that the Lord has done for you. And the man went throughout that whole area telling his story. And just like this man, you have a story if you're saved today. <laughs> May not be as dramatic as this guy. Not everybody can have a salvation testimony that they ran around naked in the graveyard before they got saved, right? Not everybody can be that dramatic. But you know what? It doesn't matter. You have a story, and it's going to resonate with somebody else. It's going to really mean something to someone else that may come from a similar background. And so keep sharing your story with others. And in your handout, it says, before long, you will become part of somebody else's story. Take this message home. Use it this week. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's incredible. 
And I wanted you to see that video because you don't have to be a Bible scholar to witness and share your faith. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to, to plant those seeds in people's lives. So I want you to be encouraged today. God can use you.